Okay, welcome to uh, the seminar, uh, Is Genesis History? We're talking about the geology uh, track or the geology major within the, the, the seminar. And my name is Steve Austin. I'm a geologist. I'm a soft rock geologist or sedimentary geologist. I teach at Cedarville University. I teach petrology, the study of rocks. And I also teach a course called uh, Stratigraphy and Sedimentology. So those are the two uh, uh, courses I teach. I also teach online at Liberty a little bit, Liberty University. And uh, I run uh, a, a corporation called Austin Research Consulting, which is a for-profit corporation. But I work, uh, and I'm kind of have geologists will travel, so I submit proposals to be funded for research, and then a nonprofit uh, gives me uh, um, an, a, a wor working uh, a salary, and that's that's how I do my research. So I contract with a nonprofit, and I currently work with uh, Logos Research Associates in Santa Ana, California. And uh, so that's how I, uh, I'm doing currently uh, research on Dead Sea Mud and uh, uh, the, the Mud Project. A little bit else about uh, me, uh, I live in Pittsburgh. I have a corporation in California. I have an, uh, a physical office in Washington State and um, I... <laughs> I uh, teach at Ohio, uh, Cedarville University, and in Virginia at, uh, um, at at Liberty, and I work for the God of Heaven. Any questions? <laughs> okay. Um, I, lo I love uh, rocks and geology, and I've lived through the time of the catastrophic plate tectonics revolution, and the, or the plate tectonics revolution. So I remember back in the late 1960s hearing professors saying the continents are stationary and the mantle of the earth has the rheological properties of, of steel. Forget about thinking about continental drift and that type of thing. And then um, I remember the same professors telling me that the continents have moved and uh, they changed their mind. And then I said, well, what else are you telling me that might not be true? <laughs> and so I became critical of all of the paradigm systems of geology by seeing these things. Okay, well, um, I pushed the button here, and uh, it should work, right? Let's see what happens here. Yeah, there we go. Okay, the idea of the continent splitting apart. That's, uh, that's what we're talking about. And it's called continental drift. Uh, that's the way pe most people know that. But I'm going to call it continental sprint. Okay, give it a different name. And uh, the technical term is uh, what? Catastrophic plate tectonics, or CPT. So uh, I, I want to make it generally intelligible to everybody. So let's just call it continental sprint. And I I'm. Uh, as different from the old theory of continental drift. So a global flood model for Earth history. Now, I like talking about rocks, and I like giving my explanation. I don't like trashing evolution. Uh, I like thinking like a catastrophist, uh, talking about rocks that way. And so a global flood model for Earth history, I think, is what we should all be thinking about uh, contributing how was the earth created and the, what is the process that formed it. Obviously a global flood is in the, a major part of earth history. Um, six of us here, Steve Austin, John Baumgartner, Russ Humphreys, Andrew Snelling, Larry Vardaman, and Kurt Wise got together about 25 years ago. We started thinking about global flood model for earth history. And uh, as a result of the association of six of us, and we started talking about catastrophic plate tectonics or the idea of continental sprint, that's when this uh, working group 
of uh, Philly had started working and uh, we kind of sketched a flood model for Earth history that uh, raised the bar from previous uh, explanations and all the other explanations and there are other several other types of tectonic models that creationists have come up with that they're uh, they're held uh, accountable to our uh, bar maybe and not that we can't uh, all do better but uh, and, and um, flood models are controversial among geologists and among creationists and so we need to we need to think about these things but here's here's a, a where we're thinking we're thinking a global flood model for earth history okay take a look at the earth I'll talk about two things um, here the continents and the oceans take a look at the continents the continents uh, are uh, in this polar view seem to be dominant but uh, it's what 29 percent of the Earth's surface area is continent and continental shelves that's shallow rock and it's uh, that area it has an average elevation of about 2,000 feet above sea level. So continents and continental shelf, that 29% of the planet is about 20, uh, or 2,000 feet above sea level, a little more. And then look at the other part of the planet, the ocean floor. Its average depth or elevation is below sea level is about 16,000 feet. So the planet has two dominant elevations the 2,000 feet elevation of the continents and the 16,000 feet uh, depth of the abyssal plain of the floor of the, the major oceans. And uh, so that's, uh, that's interesting. And the other, other thing about it is uh, um, we, we need models to explain that. So here's the overview. And this is the outline that we originally sketched in 1994 when we presented catastrophic plate tectonics at the International Conference on Creationism in Pittsburgh. We talked about tectonic models, the, the pre-flood Earth, what was the physical cause of the global flood, computer models for catastrophic plate tectonics, sediment transport mechanisms, volcanoes and earthquakes, termination of the flood, how the flood ended, post-flood geologic process, and climate, post-flood climate, and then some basic conclusions. That was the overview of the part. And so I'll just kind of go over that uh, 25, or uh, almost 25 years uh, after we talked about it. Tectonic models. Ancient literature, it's kind of interesting. You go to uh, the idea of tectonics and it's in ancient literature. It's in the statements of scripture. The theory of Antonio Snyder, a uh, German uh, Italian who uh, was an immigrant to the United States who lived in Ohio. Sounds like somebody like me. Uh, anyway, uh, Antonio Snyder's theory, the uh, modern theories of continental drift and plate tectonics. Okay, uh, in the uh, uh, ancient uh, texts and scripts, Babylonian, uh, Egyptian, there's ancient literature describing the formation of the earth, tectonic models. What does scripture say about the formation of continents and ocean basins? That's interesting. Genesis 1-9, and God said, let the waters below the heavens be gathered together into one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. Now, think about the text uh, in context there. This is the first process-oriented passage. Let the waters below the heavens be gathered together in one place. And so it implies a super ocean. And let the dry land appear maybe a, a supercontinent. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so the supercontinent and uh, super ocean, the idea. And anyway, that idea uh, impacted 
speculation about the origin of continents and ocean basins. Uh, God said, let the waters be gathered together in one place. Let the light dry land. And the gathering together, he called them seas. And the, the mikvaot of the oceans, he called those seas, the gathering places. And so that's Hebrew uh, terminology. And uh, any angel witnessing creation is going to see what? 340 million cubic miles of water on the present earth move into ocean basins? Boy, that would be a powerful event. And of course, uh, 2 Peter chapter 3, the earth was formed out of water and in the water, whereby the world that then was, which deluged with water, perished. So, uh, looks like uh, an important tectonic hydraulic event in the history of the, of the earth. Did a seafloor upheaval cause Noah's flood? There's a good question. Genesis 7-11, you know, in the 600 year of Noah's life, the second month, the 17th day of the month, the same day where all the fountains of the great deep broken up and the windows of heaven were opened and all the high hills under the whole heaven were covered, Genesis 7-19. So uh, all the fountains of the great deep were broken up in one day and then the flood goes from the ocean floor onto the continent. The fountains of the great deep, I think Hebrew scholars recognize the great deep as Tahom Rabbah. It's a stereotype compound noun in Hebrew. So therefore, it's something that the Hebrews had uh, awe and respect for. And it, it's obviously ocean, ocean floor, whatever's down there. And the, so they understood something about the, the, the ocean the Tahom or the depths. So the fountains of great deep were broken up and the word broken up is the Hebrew word beka, beka, and it means to split or to cleave. It's like an egg cracking open, something like that. And, or a wine skin bursting. That same Hebrew verb is used to describe the cleaving of the Mount of Olives when Messiah comes back to Zechariah chapter 14. So the word broken up is a very good explanatory word. All the fountains of great deep are broken up, or broken open, or burst open, or cleaved apart. And a, a derivative of that word is used to, for a type of mountain, a beka, and valley. And, okay, and all the high hills on the whole heaven were covered. Hebrew superlative there. Uh, Antonio Snyder, in his book, La Creation et Ses Mysteries de Volier, The Creation and Mysteries Revealed, published in France, the pre-flood supercontinent, according to Am Antonio Snyder, he proposed that the continents were joined together like we see in this drawing from his book, and then they split apart. 1859, he published the theory of catastrophic plate tectonics. He thought that the continents split apart uh, during the flood. Created a widespread flood, this uh, splitting apart occurred. And he wrote a book on it. It was a bad year to publish the theory of catastrophic plate tectonics. What happened? in 1859. Okay, so the world was not looking for another apologetic for creation in the flood. They were looking for something else. And so the popularity of Darwin and evolution, that was thought uh, uh, significant. And so Antonio Snyder's idea of continental sprint, that's, that's the the father of, uh, of our theory. Continental Sprint goes back to Antonio Snyder, 1859, clearly does, and uh, for earlier biblical thinking about this model. So um, it went on the shelf to gather dust for 50 years, and then Alfred Wagner slowed it down. He said not continental sprint, but continental drift. And so that, uh, that explanation uh, about 1910, so 
another 50 years later, it was slowed down. Now, we don't know uh, whether Wagner read Antonio Snyder, but I think it's obvious that they he knew of the work. Okay, take a look at the ocean basins. What happened to the floor of the pre-flood Earth? Look at, look at this view uh, of the planet. You see the uh, abyssal plain and uh, dotted with oceanic islands and a, mar a margin with this uh, great tectonic belt all around it with the andesite uh, volcanoes and that that is uh, leads to the question what happened to the floor of the pre-flood ocean when I took marine geology in the in 1970 uh, the they were counting 10,000 seafloor volcanoes on the floor of the Pacific Ocean and much more since then so uh, it's a it's a volcanic view of the of planet Earth when you look at it that, from that perspective. Uh, upheaval, um, what, splitting open of the fountains of the great deep, whatever you want to say. What happened to the floor of the pre-flood ocean? Okay, and that should be a good question uh, to ask. In the internal structure of the Earth, okay, the granite uh, continental lithosphere, the basaltic oceanic lithosphere, that's what we want to talk about. The crust of the Earth, uh, the continental crust is very thin, less than 100 kilometers thick, okay, generally in that, and very thin. The mantle of the Earth is the main volume of the Earth, and it's hundreds or thousands of kilometers deep. And then the core of the Earth, volume-wise, uh, a partial fraction of the Earth. The mantle is the main part of the Earth. The mantle is rigid material. It behaves in a, a non-liquid way. It's not plastic. It transmits uh, shear waves, so it has to have shear strength. It's not watery, a kind of fluid material. The outer core, though, doesn't transmit the earthquake S wave, and so we think the inner core is solid, but the outer core may be uh, liquid. Anyway, that's the, the mantle of the Earth has to be uh, uh, rheologically stiff material and then continents are definitely rigid. Continental crust is like you see in the bottom of Grand Canyon. That's typical continental crust. Uh, underneath uh, there's granite material and here's the granite in Grand Canyon. You see uh, zoaster granite, Vishnu schist, micas, quartz, that type of thing. <laughs> Lots of feldspar under the uh, there. You see uh, zoaster granite in Grand Canyon. You see the, the, this type of uh, migmatite structure. Lots of feldspar quartz in between uh, feldspar and biotite micas and that type of thing. And that's the the composition of the of the crust of the earth. The average density of that material is something like uh, about 2.7 grams per cubic centimeter. 2.7 times the density of water. That's what uh, continental crust looks like, typically. Granted, in the microscope, you can see the feldspars, you can see quartz, you can see the micas, and that's the, 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 the typical uh, continental crust. It's granite composition. Basalt under the microscope is different. It has a large little uh, crystals or phenocrysts of olivine in a finer texture, uh, uh, usually amphibole or pyroxene with a little bit of feldspar, hardly any quartz. And so that makes the typical basalt. And the average basalt might be over three grams per cubic centimeter, its density. So its density is greater by uh, a small fraction, 10% or something like that, than uh, granite. Why are there oceans? The continental crust is lower density, density 
of the crust is less than the density of the ocean floor and the ocean crust. The ocean crust is what? Basalt, and the continental crust is granite. So the ocean floor uh, has the greater density, and so it's like balsa wood floating next to oak. Okay, balsa wood is going to float higher, and that, that's the principle of isostasis. The day before the flood, we think the Earth was, our, our working group of six, we think that the continental crust was like we see today, granite in composition. The ocean floor was about the same composition as we see today, but it was cooler then, and so that continental, uh, that, that, that ocean floor uh, was greater density than uh, the continents and uh, the mantle of the earth. Okay, if the density of the mantle of the earth is, and the earth it had, the, it had the same composition, the crust and the mantle, the oceanic crust and the mantle, if they had the same composition and the ocean crust was cooler, then the cooler material would have higher density than the mantle underneath it. And so we think the general composition of the mantle of the earth is basaltic, but the ocean floor above it was higher density than it. Okay, so the ocean floor, the pre-flood earth, and maybe the, of, even of the present earth, because it's lower temperature, has higher density than underneath it. And so the ocean crust has a tendency to sink. Think of the ocean crust as an aircraft carrier floating there. Okay, if you could get it in the right configuration or orientation, you could sink it. And so that's the, the, the scenario that, that, that we've thought. What was the physical cause of Noah's flood? How about an external, uh, internal, or supernatural cause? What do you What do you think about that? Genesis seven eleven suggests it's uh, on the ocean floor. All the fountains of the great deep were broken up. Okay, and it it doesn't talk about an extraterrestrial object. It talks about rain from heaven. Yes but it mentions the fountains of the great deep first. All the fountains of the great deep were broken. <laughs> Typical of Hebrew text to, to give you um, primary cause first. Anyway, so Genesis 7.11 indicates to me an internal cause for the flood. Uh, God pushing a button and then the process going. Uh, effects uh, new hot ocean floor. Uh, the new hot ocean floor, if, if you create a new ocean floor, would cause what? The ocean basins to rise. The present ocean basin is 16,000 feet on, below sea level on the average. If you replaced it with new hot ocean floor, that would raise the ocean floor relative to the continents, and you could flood the continents easily by that mechanism. Just cause the the general seafloor upheaval and create new ocean floor, what does that do? That creates uh, a, new, uh, a new volume on the earth, and so there's enough ocean to cover the whole planet, the present topography. Uh, 340 million cubic miles of water raise the ocean basins just hundreds of feet, just hundreds of feet, and what would happen? You could flood virtually all of the continents. There'd be a few mountains sticking up, but, but uh, so we have plenty of water for essentially a global flood. Okay, in the process of, uh, of, of tectonics, plate tectonics is spreading, subduction, and mantle-wide flow. I'll review that and talk about that. And I think that's in the physical cause. Initiation of the flood, hand of God, um, the slamming of the door of the ark, something like that, or some astronomical cause like a comet, a meteorite, asteroid, or planet coming by. Those are ex external cause. I like terrestrial, and our working group like the idea of terrestrial cause. Radioactivity, heat buildup, uh, all kinds of things to talk about uh, 
and thinking about causes. The initiation of the flood the same day where all the fountains of the great deep broken up and the windows of heaven were opened. There's the, uh, the initiation of the flood. It began in one day. And so I think the, the major energy input to the ocean floor starting early in, in the flood year created the, the major part of the flood. The flood lasted for what? Uh, five months the waters prevailed and then the waters receded over seven months. Noah was in the ark for over a year. The situation before the flood, we had the uh, cold, uh, dense ocean floor uh, crust and we had the mantle underneath it. Then we replaced it with hot ocean floor, which would what? propel the oceans over the continents. Do you understand the, the idea of the, the thermal uh, state of the earth created during the flood? Now we like that. We were thinking that way. Spreading, subduction, and mantle-wide flow. Spreading works okay. Mantle-wide uh, uh, subduction works around the edges of continents and then mantle-wide flow. So that's what needs to be mod modeled. The resistance to plate tectonics was thinking in the range of here, mantle-wide flow. And so now uh, we're, we're thinking that way. Subduction happens around the uh, margins of, uh, ocean, uh, of ocean floor uh, continent boundaries. Mantle-wide flow inside the mantle. There's the, the rifting spreading, so that's what you want to think about. Okay, so we have this uh, continental sprint, a, a global flood model for Earth history. Let's talk about uh, some of the uh, computer modeling that's been going on. In our working group, John Baumgartner did his PhD dissertation and subsequent studies on what's called the Terra computational mesh. And the Terra computational mesh is basically a computer code built to model deformation in three in three dimensional space. And so, when you have a sphere, you and you're modeling, you have to have some spherical geometry. And so, we we're modeling here in in the Terra computational mesh the mantle of the Earth, and we break up the mantle of the Earth into rectangular, triangular and icosahedral uh, shapes, okay, and so that's the, the the geometry. And then we give each one of those little nodes, and in this particular model there's 174,114 little uh, bricks that form the mantle of the earth, and then we're, we can model the deformation of it. <clears throat> Here you see a printout of the uh, de at depth, uh, depth of 200 kilometers, the temperature structure of the Earth as the modeling begins. And you can see the, the initial configuration. You got a supercontinent here called Pangaea with Tethys, this kind of broad ocean here. And you have the unzipping or breaking of the supercontinent along the familiar boundaries. Okay, you got you begin with Africa kind of geometry, uh, South America geometry, and you you let those rigid plates move relative to one another as you do subduction and spreading, and that this is what happens. You can do it do it in cross section, three dimension. There's plates being submerged uh, or subducted into the mantle of the earth. This is uh, uh, showing colder material falling into the mantle at two different locations. Here's spreading occurring as hot materials rising. Okay, um, here is 20 days into the simulation as we let the ocean floor be detached or unzipped from the boundary, it what? It, it is higher density than the mantle underneath because it's created in a cold condition from creation week, say. It wants to fall. 
and it falls underneath the margin of the supercontinent, and then what happens? Spreading occurs because the Earth has to stay the same volume, the mantle of the Earth has to stay the same volume, so as materials recede into the mantle, spreading has to occur. So there's the spherical geometry of the, of the split up of Pangaea. And so this is 20 days into it, and you can see the see what happened. It uh, uh, you've got uh, cold material being subducted around the margin of the of the continent, and then you hot material rising. It's also showing you topographic uh, display here that uh, this ocean uh, the, where the rifting occurs, it rises, and where the subduction occurs, it's depressed. And you can see the, the cold material going down into the mantle, the, the depth in the mantle and the warm material coming up. Okay, here's 60, uh, 40 days into the simulation. The, the mantle of the earth is able to deform in, uh, in plate subduction in a rapid way. And so what happens is the acceleration occurs to essentially a fast walking pace, millimeters or uh, meters per second, that kind of thing, that type of velocity. Here it is at 60 days into the deformation experiment. You can see the large part of the Atlantic Ocean formed. There's the Atlantic Ocean. Here's the Indian Ocean forming. Here's the closing of Tethys with the formation of Mediterranean. The split apart of Greenland from uh, Europe and North America. And here's the mid ocean uh, ridge system developing along the familiar, just begin with that familiar boundaries. And it, it, uh, the, the calculation makes it happen. That's kind of an interesting uh, display. Now we put vectors on it, and you can see velocity vectors. Uh, maximum velocity of about a meter per second. Maximum velocity of a meter per second. So the continents are deforming significantly, and a meter per second is a fast walking pace. And so that's why I call it continental sprint. Do you like that? Now, where would be the only place that you could survive on planet Earth during such an event? Imagine continents moving a meter per second relative to one another. How about an arc well provisioned with food? Okay, imagine the seafloor upheaval that would be going on, not magnitude eight earthquakes essentially in one place, but magnitude nine or 10 earthquakes, super earthquakes along a belt around a, uh, a continent that's, that's that's splitting apart as plates are converging, that type of uh, uh, deformation would be uh, significant. Here you see the polar view. You can see the formation of the, Adla of the Arctic Ocean. The Arctic Ocean forms from pull apart. And there's Greenland, there's North America, there's Asia, and so the, the Arctic Ocean forms this way. And then the other, here's the Proto-Pacific Ocean uh, floor being thrust underneath uh, Asia and uh, there North America, there's the Mid-Ocean Ridge starting uh, in Mid-Pacific. Here's the, the South Polar view. <laughs> you can see Antarctica, it, uh, it starts attached to uh, Australia and and then it splits apart. Okay, here, here's South America, there's Africa, and that whole thing happens. Place I know best is Alaska, and I love going to Alaska and studying uh, the mountains of southern Alaska, and uh, it looks like accreted terrain. There is ocean floor that's been docked or shoved up against southern Alaska. So I like thinking that way about 
the, the, the modern uh, ocean trench, uh, the Aleutian Trench, but um, as I think about the Aleutian Trench and look at the active faulting in southern Alaska, I think how um, tepid compared to the ancient super faults that must have been there and uh, the, 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 the big collision that occurred in the past, like the Wrangell uh, Mountains. And there's Copper River, there's Chetna, there's Wrangell, St. Elias, uh, and, and that whole mountain belt there, head-on collision. And so a head-on collision is a, a, a big thing. Okay, down in California and in Washington, Oregon, we had an oblique collision. So the, the ocean floor is doing some interesting things. Here's some more uh, southern Alaska. Love thinking and looking at those mountains as uh, basically sea floor that was compressed up against continent. It makes you a believer in subduction, catastrophic subduction, not present subduction. Okay, modern subduction may be occurring in Alaska, but how weak and uh, bland it is compared to the ancient subduction that that created um, the, the whole mountain range in southern Alaska. Okay, sediment transport mechanisms, we might think about this. Ocean floor is basically a conveyor belt that's bringing ocean crust up against continent and bringing in ocean sediment, scraping it off, and since the, the margin of the continent is depressed, the, and the big earthquake activities right here, you're creating tsunamis they're able to um, generate waves onto the continent. So here is the, here's a, a dynamic uh, model for the beginning of the flood. Think of Western North America, sea floors being shoved underneath Western North America, and what? Uh, the scrapings are put over the continent. And at the, indeed, the ocean was over the continent. Take a look at Grand Canyon. We have the Great Unconformity right here, uh, and there's the Tapete Sandstone, and the bottom of the Tapete Sandstone is composed of boulders. This boulder is Shinumu Quartzite. It's uh, over 20 feet in diameter, must weigh many thousands of tons, okay? And it's in a, a slurry of boulders sitting there at the Great Unconformity. Imagine the tectonic upheaval that was involved with breaking uh, quartzite boulders and strewing them around on the ocean floor and then bringing in the sand that makes the bottom of what's called the sock sequence. And that great unconformity in sock sequence goes across the North American continent. Uh, wow, okay. Uh, there's evidence of this out in the Mojave Desert and I've had students working on that terrain moving on that terrain, and, and here's, a, here's a, a piece of ocean floor we, th we, we mapped. We think it's over a kilometer thick. It slid and rotated as a giant slide, and that's associated with uh, seaward of the, of the great unconformity. So gravity collapse of ocean floor. Uh, look at uh, water current structures like the Navajo sandstone or the Coconino sandstone. You can see the, uh, the um, amazing structure. This is evidence of fast moving water, not wind. Uh, you you want to uh, get to know that con controversy if you, if you do. Uh, it's, um, it, it's apparent it's fast moving water. The, the nature of the cross bedding of the sandstone, the uh, the bounding surfaces, many of the, these features are, are uh, water features, not wind features. And so geologists need to think in terms of water deposition of large masses of sandstone, like Navajo sandstone, Coconino sandstone. If it's water borne, it's very fast moving water. That's the problem. It's an ocean moving at meters per second something like that, and that's, uh, that's a fast-moving ocean. And so uh, um, that's why geologists have been reluctant to think that way when they're thinking in terms of slow and gradual. Continental sprint, 
uh, makes a, a big uh, sandstone lithosomes, uh, rock bodies. Okay, in the Grand Canyon we have the Tapit sandstone. Out in Mojave Desert we have the Wood uh, Wood Canyon. Okay, uh, we we have all of the uh, sandstones associated with uh, the Cordilleran uh, fold belt going up into, in, into uh, Arctic and uh, through the center, uh, eastern central area of the United States. Uh, it's here in Tennessee, but it'd be down quite deep. Uh, be down maybe two miles down. You're gonna, a uh, mile down, okay, uh, to find the sandstone body. But it, uh, uh, it, it'll be uh, up at the surface in extreme eastern Tennessee. And then uh, in Pittsburgh, it's 17,000 feet below my house is the great unconformity in that sand bed sitting there. So this great sandstone lithosome surrounds the Canadian shield and demands a catastrophic explanation. And I love thinking in terms of uh, ocean flood over the continent. And of course we have ocean fossils associated with this big body. So the ocean was over the continent, early, early flood. Um, other interesting fossil deposits such as uh, painted, uh, well the petrified forests in Holbrook, Arizona. You have uh, Shinley formation with thousands of petrified logs. Is it a forest? No, it's a petrified log mat national park. That's uh, maybe that would be the new name for it. And uh, you can see logs that are embedded in volcanic ash that have been very beautifully agatized. Uh, they're sitting there and they have a dominant orientation. They just like the, the logs uh, at the edge of Spirit Lake at Mount St. Helens. And coal beds have uh, evidence of a floating mat origin. I've been uh, working on origin of coal from floating log mats, associated uh, the, the shale uh, layers and sandstone and limestone layers with coal very thin but very extremely widespread. And then Dinosaur National Monument, think about that. On the one wall at Dinosaur National Monument Visitor Center where you have the quarry sandstone, there are 1,500 bones, individual bones, of dinos, many of them are articulated or partially articulated, like this type of thing. And then you see what? It's a, it's a bone bed, uh, and they, they're killed animals, largely dismembered carcasses and, and the debris around there. Around them are uh, the most abundant uh, animal on the, the quarry face is what? Clams, okay, uno clam, <laughs> okay, which is kind of interesting. Clams and dinosaurs mixed together, okay, and that's uh, uh, and 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 it's uh, obviously a catastrophic slurry, hyper concentrated slurry. That's the way I understand that. Um, here's another uh, debris flow or slurry flow. Here's a layer in Glen Rose, Texas limestone layer and you see what three feet thick you see what appears to be uh, round rocks take a look at it and inside there are whole clams closed clams a debris flow of closed clams uh, in a layer what does that indicate the clams were uh, articulated the muscles close the clams when clams watch up on the beach they fall apart because the hinging ligament in the shell pops the shell open. So these clams died by being buried alive, okay? And when you start thinking that way, um, it, mud flow and slurry flow is, is obviously one of the major ways that sediment moves. Okay, termination of the flood, let's talk about the statements of scripture, and then let's talk about how the accommodation space was made for the present oceans to get the oceans back in the basins and the beveled surfaces we see on the continents and that scripture Genesis 8 um, 
the waters retreated from the earth, going and retreating, and the waters were going and falling until the 10th month. And so the waters uh, are coming and going. Halak, halak vashub in the Hebrew. The waters were coming and going. In other words, some kind of oscillatory flow, and uh, that could cause beveling of surfaces. And the waters were going and falling until the 10th month. So from the fifth month to the 10th month, right in there, five months, certainly of oscillatory flow, something like that. And then the ocean, and then the, they're in the ark still for another uh, three months. That whole thing is happening um, and, until they, uh, they, they depart from the ark. So uh, the waters were were going and falling. The same uh, verb structure is used to describe the, the dove going out and coming and going and trying to find a place to rest. So the water retreat is uh, um, very interesting. And so look at the flat plateau of the surface of the Grand Canyon. And that plateau is uh, extremely widespread, called the Colorado Plateau Surface. And it goes into the Great Basin, where uh, and and it's in the Great Plains, and so that, uh, that that's the bevel surface. And then out in the in the east here, we have the conglomerates, Ogallala conglomerate, that that covers the uh, the the prairies and the plain, and makes this uh, groundwater conduit, but it's at the surface, and so. Uh, much of uh, the interior of North America is like this, an elevated plain sloping away down here toward the Gulf of Mexico. And then, of course, we have the erosion of Grand Canyon. What, what's the most amazing part of the Grand Canyon? Probably, from the erosion point of view, it's the plain above, not the, uh, the canyon below. Pre-flood geologic process, post-flood geologic process, the tectonics of the post-flood, and that's, might want to think about that. Want to think about what uh, happened with volcanoes, sedimentation, erosion, and then uh, global cooling and leading to climate. Okay, what is the post-flood world like? The post-flood world is exponential decline. Geologic activity and intensity decreases with time from the end of the flood to the present. Average temperature of the earth declines with time. Okay, temperature extremes decline, precipitation, now all of that. Uh, volcanism declines with time. Tectonics declines with time. Uh, that's the, that, that's the, uh, the, the post-flood story. So you can imagine vertical tectonics taking over as horizontal tectonics is shutting down, largely shutting down. Now the, the present continents may be moving at the rate at which your fingernail grows, but did the, the collision of India with Southern Asia, Tibet, create the Himalaya Mountains? You know what the momentum involved in such uh, a, a, a collision would produce? Uh, okay, so imagine, uh, think, think about rapid uh, horizontal tectonics and then the relaxation and the finishing of that tectonics and then the, the vertical tectonics taking over. I think the, the power source of global tectonics was the relative density of the pre-flood ocean floor relative to the top and bottom of the mantle of the earth. In other words, the ocean floor, the energy for the flood is essentially the ocean floor. And the ocean floor higher density was able to be subducted. It was replaced with new ocean floor, hot ocean floor, which couldn't be subducted. And so the flood stopped. And as it stopped, what happened? Vertical tectonics took over. So imagine, uh, imagine that the, 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 the Subduction essentially stops, detached uh, subductive slabs, underplating of continents. Then, of course, underplating would create rise, uh, uplift, unloading, 
all kinds of things to think about there. But change in the rate of plate motion, the slowing of, of plate motion, creating the present margins of continents. And imagine the tectonics associated with, for example, the Tapete sandstone being flexed into vertical position. That's associated with the, re the retreat of the floodwaters in Grand Canyon. The, uh, the great uh, East Kaibab monocline in Grand Canyon. Volcanoes and earthquakes, they decline with time. There's, there's the present uh, ocean floor, Pacific Ocean floor, and see the ring of fire all around. It's not a ring of fire, it's really a basin of fire. And uh, the, the earthquakes on the ocean floor and volcanoes on the ocean floor. Here's some volcano terminology, uh, uh, USGS. Uh, we have batholiths and stocks and plutons giving rise to dikes, which are magma intruded into uh, vertically into cracks, sills horizontally into cracks, uh, conduits uh, coming up to uh, composite cone volcanoes. There's large flood basalt lava plateaus around enormous calderas that are out there uh, for study and uh, explosion, uh, crypto explosion structures, mar, that kind of thing, volcanic ash rings, uh, cones, uh, that, uh, that's the typical structure uh, of, of, of volcanic uh, landforms uh, at the surface and at depth. Edge of uh, the continent, okay, we can see where uh, here's South America, and here's the Andes Mountains. And so the, 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 the granite batholiths are intruded in the late stages of the flood. It takes time for the magma to get to the surface. And so late in the flood is when a lot of these uh, big uh, plutons are breaking loose. And when they, when they uh, reach the surface, they formed uh, uh, big uh, volcanic provinces. The, uh, we think of volcanoes as being what? Uh, vent structures from um, pipes, okay, nozzle eruptions. We know a little bit about what we think about caldera eruption. You know, caldera is a large circular feature that the earth unzips and turns into a, itself and creates an elliptical ring elliptical ring fissure eruptions, we haven't really experienced those in human history, but we know they're there. How about a linear fissure array eruption? Geologists are thinking about super volcanoes of the past. Plates moving fast create large dikes and, uh, that, that erupt magma. And imagine uh, like in Mexico, the Sierra Madre Occidental Mountains. It's basically a giant volcanic pile, but looking into the volcanic pile, you can't find nozzle eruption volcanoes, like composite cone type of things, or like Mount St. Helens kind of style. You, you don't even see elliptical ring fissures like at Yellowstone. You see this unusual uh, uh, dike Erup, uh, eruptions from from linear fissure, and uh, that's the that's the style, and that's the kind of volcano you would expect when uh, catastrophic plate tectonics or continental sprint is happening, and some of that is seen in these these mountain belts, California, for example. Here's a volcanic ash in Oregon. And then you see above it the Columbia River basalts, a giant lake of lava, hundreds of cubic miles, thousand cubic miles of uh, ma uh, magma was erupted at the Earth's surface, forming lava lakes and lava flows of wide extent. Uh, super volcanoes or volcanoes in the past are a lot bigger than today. For example, here uh, I've sketched Mount St. Helens. There's Mount St. Helens in Washington State, and it erupted in May of 1980, and it created about one quarter cubic mile of ash in 1980 from the eruption of Mount St. Helens. And it's microscopic in scale. 
down there. I can't even show it to you in, in resolution, but it, it's, a, it's a quarter cubic mile. And then you see ancient volcanoes, for example, Yellowstone volcano. Here's Long Valley Caldera. And then in back of this is the volcano that made the Brushy Basin member of the Morrison Formation. That's the, the that contains the dinosaurs there at Dinosaur National Monument. There's 4,000 cubic miles of ash in the middle part of the Morrison Formation. Evidently erupted from fissures, linear fissures in Southern California. So that is erupted uh, from the uh, Sierra Nevada batholith, or Sierra Nevada plutons, going down into uh, Southern Peninsula Range and, the, and down into Baja, California. And so we see uh, uh, this being the source of that, that red area. And uh, so linear fissure rays of the past. 4,000 cubic miles. So volcanoes scale down after the flood. And I'm showing to you in historic order. That's, that's the, the Jurassic. Here's the, uh, the, Pleist, uh, or the Pliocene. There's the Pleistocene. And there's the present. So volcanoes scale down. So there's no such thing as the present is key to the past when you're looking at volcanoes. The present volcanoes are a keyhole to the past. So volcanoes scale down. Big deltas are built in the post-flood period. Here's a Nile River delta. It's a huge delta. And post-flood built rapidly following the flood. Uh, here is a geophysical cross-section uh, made uh, two-way travel time showing the depth of uh, the of deltas being down two or three miles deep. Offshore Louisiana now, there um, we're finding the Wilcox Formation, which is in southern Texas, down, it's been drilled six miles below sea level, six miles through sediment off or on the southern, on southern uh, Louisiana. It's huge. There's a huge delta sitting there, thousands. Uh, cubic miles of sediment, and that's the, the, that's the runoff from the beveling of the continents, I believe, largely in the late flood and, of course, in the post-flood period that we live in. Uh, erosion, here's a Palouse River in southern uh, Washington State. You see what? There's, there's a railing with people. There's a 400-foot deep canyon in solid Columbia River basalt eroded. Geologists had said that that took long period to be eroded. Imagine the present river eroding this canyon, one sand grain at a time over immense periods of time, you might imagine. It's been generally acknowledged by geologists now that Palouse River was gorge was gouged out by the Spokane flood about 500 cubic miles of water in a lake in Montana breached through an ice dam and over eastern, southeastern uh, Washington state cut these canyons and catastrophic uh, erosion of those canyons. And uh, as a result of that, you might think of catastrophic erosion of Grand Canyon from uh, breaching of lakes. Here is uh, the Kaibab upwarp in northern Arizona. There's a evidence of a lake on the east side of the upwarp in uh, Hopi uh, land off in uh, Holbrook down uh, up to Kapirowitz Plateau in the north. That's 500 cubic miles of water there. Another 1,000 cubic miles of water beyond the Kapirowitz uplift in uh, southern Utah and maybe four or five other lakes up there. This this it looks like a breach dam, and many of us have, have talked that way. Geologists are jettisoning the idea of millions of years to form Grand Canyon. There was a meeting of geologists on the south rim of Grand Canyon, uh, oh, about 15 years ago, 
and the, the headline of the geologist meeting was on the newspaper was geologists believe that Grand Canyon formed in a fraction of a million years. The, the general consensus among the geologists there was not tens of millions of years of erosion that formed Grand Canyon. And as you look at Grand Canyon, what? It's a canyon that's quit forming. If you look at it, the Grand Canyon is being plugged by landslides from the, the sides. The rapids are stable. The rapids have been there for over 150 years now that we've taken photographs of the, the rapids in Grand Canyon. New rapids are forming. The, the channel down the gravel uh, on the bank of the river is, uh, is stable, so the modern process is not deepening or widening the Grand Can uh, the, the river process not widening the Grand Canyon. So the Colorado River is trapped in the Grand Canyon. The Grand Canyon is what? A relic feature formed by something else in the past, not the Colorado River, present Colorado River. What would it take to make the Grand Canyon erode? Uh, deeper. It would take a flood somewhere around at least half a million cubic feet per second down the channel of the river. 10,000 cubic feet per second is a mod moderate flow today. Something like, what, uh, over 50 to 100 times the present flow just to flush out the material that's blocking the river, essentially, and blocking the erosion. Okay, well, let's, uh, uh, let, let's talk about some idea of, about breach dam over the Kaibab upwarp. That's the idea of, of a catastrophic breaching. That's, that's the overtopping explanation of the Grand Canyon. The idea that the, the terrain was overtopped, that is very obvious to geologists, and geologists can't forget about that. And uh, so that's the, uh, uh, that's the takeaway. It looks like Grand Canyon was overtopped by something, say gravity or uh, catastrophic drainage of lakes. Post-flood features, uh, evidence of exponential cooling of the oceans, increased raininess, uh, onset of glaciation, increasing aridity, and uh, many centuries after the flood. Let's talk about some of that. Uh, a core of the Arctic Ocean, the oxygen isotope concentration in the core indicates that the Arctic Ocean at one time was 30 degrees centigrade. Can you believe that? Here's a model, climatic model, beginning with hot Arctic Ocean and with hot oceans generally. And as the Earth cooled, as the oceans cooled, because of the tectonics and the heat from the global tectonics, it created rain, raininess, and of course, in the, the raininess in the northern areas leads to what? The buildup of ice and glaciers. So you can imagine what it was like in the post-flood period with the hot Arctic Ocean and the hot oceans generally and the earth is cooling off and what it leads to glaciers. And then the glaciers uh, leave these valleys. There's Yosemite Valley. There's the blast zone of Mount St. Helens, but I want to indicate to you that uh, elk are taking advantage of the blast zone of Mount St. Helens. They love it. And animals are, are specially adapted to taking advantage of new habitats and things. And we, we think how fragile ecosystems are, but uh, at Mount St. Helens we learned uh, in, in amazing ways that the recovery of ecosystems. And of course, uh, this is just uh, two years after Mount St. Helens erupted. And uh, now this is covered with conifer forest and uh, growing conifer forest. And the, the elk are finding all kinds of grass in there and they love it. So animals spread after the flood. You can, have, can imagine that. And of course, the drying of deserts. Okay, and we have major deserts today formed by what? The increasing aridity of the earth. Essentially what? 
global warming, okay? The Earth, after we went through the Ice Age, it had to get warm. And so, uh, and, and the evidence of, uh, of, of, the, of the drying terrain of the Earth. Okay, well, I'm basically done. I've tried to explain uh, using tectonics and uh, plate tectonics, the, the, the model that the six of us have worked, worked out. Whoops, here you see the, uh, uh, that, that familiar chart. Remember, Kurt brought this chart out, and then look at the, all the things that, that, that plate tectonics explains, especially the things with uh, um, catastrophic plate tectonics explains. And uh, these things in red um, are things that, that are better explained by catastrophic plate tectonics and, and in general. So that's the, it's a theory with a great explanatory power. <laughs>